Dear friends, uh, this is uh, Christoph, and it's it's my real pleasure to welcome you all to the podcast Learning from Leaders, organized by the Telex Institute here in Switzerland and the World Forum for Ethics in Business. And uh, as you know, in this podcast, we want to connect in an authentic, uh, direct, um, heart-to-heart way with leaders and learn from them, learn from their wins, from their losses. And today, I think we have a great leader with us, Jan Auge Fjordov. Uh, and uh, Jan, thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks for being with us today. I look forward. Well, thanks. First of all, it's a pleasure to be on. As you know, I'm a, I'm a big follower of, of the work you guys are doing, and it's a privilege to be asked. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, you are in many parts of this world, a name which does not need any introductions. Nevertheless, let me try to do justice. So Jan is obviously a Norwegian former professional footballer, a very powerful centre forward. I remember you scoring in the German Bundesliga. You played professionally for Norway. Uh, you appeared in 71 international matches, scored 20 times in those. And I think what makes your biography so special is that you quite seamlessly, we will hear more about it today, um, moved into the career after the career. Um, just a couple of highlights, what uh, what you did afterwards, you were named as a team manager of the national team, working closely with the national coach at that time, Per Matthias Hogmo. Um, we have collaborated, uh, Jan, in your, in your um, role as an advisor for the Ministry of Sports in Norway, right? leading a strategic group that advised the government how to use sports in the best possible way for the society. And now you are a sports pundit, as I would like to call it, at the ESPN, at the Sky, and many other channels. Um, now, today we want to talk about the topic of playing your potential. And, and Jan, that's something um, uh, that is very dear to me, you know, that irony that sometimes when we really want to be the best version of ourselves, when there's lots at stake, um, we are actually just a bad copy of ourselves just because it is so deeply meaningful for us. So how can we be the best version of ourselves when it really matters? And the second, I think, angle to it, how can we find ourselves in this sometimes confusing world with so many opportunities and possibilities and, and, and there's so much temptation to end up being maybe just a copy of someone else we would like to be. And, 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 and so you have faced so much pressure on and off the pitch. You just told me that you were moderating yesterday two uh, soccer games and arrived like 30 minutes before in the, <laughs> in the stadium. And you have to be the best version of yourself. And, and I actually wanted to start with a moment of failure, if I may, uh, because sometimes when we fail, when we lose, we learn the most. Do you remember a situation and would you be okay to share it with us? A moment where you actually kind of really wanted to be the best version, but but you couldn't. You just couldn't. Well, Christoph, I think that the good thing about trying to be the best of yourself is that failing is a part of that uh, exercise. It's a part of what you are doing. And I think sometimes you stand you stand where you sit somehow. I come from a very small village with 900 inhabitants. Uh, and I love going back to my little village, but still I love to be in New York. So I'm a very complex person in, in terms of a lot of issues. And I think when I... When I grew up, I, I didn't le learn all the great words. I didn't know about branding. I didn't know about the academy way of thinking. I just uh, learned about the joy to play football. I learned about the joy uh, of getting better. Uh, I learned about the joy of fulfilling my potential without and no idea that these two, three words were put together. And I think that so the, the background I had is that you, you build up a security a security also to learn to fail because that is a part of it. I, I still, I was, I was. A go you said it. Uh, thanks for the great introduction. But I was a, I was a striker. My my aim was to score goals for all the clubs I've, I've scored, uh, played in in four different countries and as you said for for my country, and uh, I had some great great highlights scoring uh, the goal when we knew that we were going to the World Cup for the first time since 1938. But I still remember also the goal I didn't score uh, when we had a, when we played the Czech Republic and just at the end, if I have scored that, we would have been at the Euros. I mean, most people have forgotten that, but I remember that. So, but it's like you're saying, you're learning from your failure 
But I think you should take a step back because I think that it's all about building up the confidence, a confidence to be able to fail. And, and I got a privilege now when I'm, I'm in the TV business. I, I speak to a lot of people. I'm, I'm mostly the oldest, I, get, I feel sometimes. But I speak to them and I say, all the people you see around you, if that is a football star or a great, great manager or some TV personality running around pitch side in a football game, they are also insecure. They just have learned, they have had an exercise to try to hide that they are as insecure as you feel yourself. Uh, and I use that, um, that trick a lot when I do interviews. Uh, this week, and as you said, I've been very busy. I did three Premier League games. I interview 11 different players and managers and high profile, more or less every of them. So I try, when I interview uh, Antonio Conte, which was one of the last thing I did uh, yesterday, I, I'm thinking of Conte being that boy, uh, have this more or less the same background as myself, trying to go his way in the world. So I think that failing is a part of your progress. And you say it, and, and sometimes we should say these things without adding that it's a cliche, because often the big truth of the world are in the cliches, because you are saying you are learning from mistakes, but, but you have to be willing to learn from them. Don't put yourself in a position as a victim, uh, especially in my background. To have a winner, you need a loser. That is the hard fact in my sport and is in any sport and, and sometimes in business and sometimes in politics and sometimes if some actors uh, running for the same role in a big film or whatever. Fantastic. And actually, when you speak about, I can feel that authenticity. Um, how did you get there? I mean, if you think back uh, in your early career, maybe as a junior on the soccer field, I mean, that fear of losing. Um, it's there everywhere, especially when there's a lot of pressure. How did, uh, was there a particular point when you realized, hey, I can almost reframe that and use it as a strength? Yeah, but first of all, and that's why I put my background in, because from where I came from, there was not, none playing for uh, any top teams in Norway. There was no one playing for your country. I mean, that was so, so far away from, from me that, that I was only in the game to, to see that I could get a better. And you can take it and say to get a, the better version of yourself, although I didn't know the words then either. So I remember when I was 16 or 17, there, there was uh, in the region where I was from, uh, uh, 20 minutes from my village, there was a, uh, a second division team, like, like in the, in nearly the, the top class, but not the top class. And my, my aim was then to be so good that I can, when I have to go to the military, as you at that time all had to do in Norway, I should be so good that they will take me back to play football games. And after three years, I've, I've made my, my debut for, for the national team. So, so in terms of vi winning and losing, I think I'm a, I'm a, I love study uh, different angles of uh, people getting better uh, and people have a culture of winning, whatever that is defined as. But I, I see that what, what they have in common is there, there is a higher thing than winning because it's something about fulfilling. I remember a businessman said, I will rather have good people doing mistakes than bad people doing the right thing. And I don't think he, he tried to be a philosopher saying that, but that made me thinking because life is about finding yourself to have the aim. If I go to a football game now as a reporter, I want to do the best I can. But when I'm finished with that, it can be a week and a strength that you don't stop. And if you're, you're, if you're doing well, you just, okay, I need the next one. If I've done, if done a good interview with Jurgen Klopp, not, where is Conte? Where is Conte? Uh, and if you don't, but if you... If you're a failure, you can start thinking, don't overthink it, but just think that it's, it's a greater aim to be as good as you can in your profession. And what I have learned in my profession is that, well, is that that means that you have a broad view to things, not only being a footballer, not only being a TV reporter, you have to have a broader thing. Like myself at the moment, I am now in, into big battles of, uh, of the world. I, I'm going through all series. I'm learning about the Constantinople, what happened there in 1453 with the Sultan coming and, and get that kind of broader view to things, then I think it's easier to accept uh, failure. Very, very powerful. I mean, um, the, if I remember the moments uh, when, when I have lost, 
Uh, it is really that the world has shrunk to that one little event right there and then. Actually, yeah. while you were talking, I was yeah. there was for me a little point. moment, you know. Um, uh, after I also used to play uh, soccer as a junior, and then I played tennis, and <laughs> I qualified for the semifinals of yeah. the uh, 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 of some tennis uh, tournament in the village, uh, and I played against a man. I was then maybe thirty five, who was sixty five, and he was about <laughs> to beat me. You know? <laughs> and I had realized how the world has shrunk to yeah. something, you know, and it was suddenly so vitally important to win this game. And of course, that's when we are the worst version of ourselves. But Absolutely. that sense of expansion, that sense of bigger picture, that sense of wanting to evolve as a human being. Uh, can really um, change the way we we deal with the challenge at hand, and that's so so powerful. Now, you know, you just told me that um, uh, you yesterday interviewed Erling Holland, and we know that you're very close to him, and we want to talk today about this phenomena as well. Um, he seems to have no problem at all with that mental aspect of the game, uh, at least at up until this moment, what do you think makes him so mentally strong? Is it also that perspective which he has, or does he just not overthink? What, what is it? Well, I think that, first of all, uh, that is the, um, the, the rich of the youth. Uh, sometimes when you are younger, you don't think of the consequences. And when I was doing my football, uh, I got more and more, what shall I say, more and more nervous in terms of as more as I knew about the consequences, you know, because if you're young, you're just playing the next game. There is always a next game. There's always a new battle somewhere. So uh, and I think that Erling will have a bit advantage of having the, that grace of the youth. That is point one. But point two, I've, he's so professional in the way he, he, uh, he prepares himself for all the challenges. And, and he is very realistic when he is analyzing his own situation. But as you're saying, Christoph, the, 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 the main thing, how do you block out all these things? And I think that he will have the same as everybody else, but he will, will find a way, he will have tools in his life that is easier for him to take that out. I think that Erling is as vulnerable as everybody else when they're going up for things. He scored, was it three games in a row? He scored a hat-trick at home. I mean, the expectation will, oh, you only scored two today or you only scored one. I mean, that is enormous. Uh, then uh, it's also about having good people around you. I think that uh, when, when we are trying to get as many cars, as many houses or furniture, whatever, I mean, what we should collect is good people around us. People that could not not necessarily being your best friends or or a, or a copy of yourself Qu quite opposite you should try to have people around you that you can can kind of um, have a good good conversation with with, with not only and I, I think now let me, let me jump to to a commercial leader a commercial leader will have um, people around him that are often always, always always agree with the leader. Uh, and I think that we should take an example of uh, it was Abraham Lincoln who had a team, a right, team of rivals uh, in, in, in and around him. And I think that is that is important. And and Erling being in a in a professional world where a lot of money, a lot of attention, a lot of pressure, he got a great team around him led by his by his dad and and some other people. So he's in good hands. So he has the advantage of the youth. So would you assume that as the career progresses? Progresses and he will start to maybe reflect more. Um, he might face also um, challenges. Well, I think he faced challenges today. I think just that he has good tools doing that. And it's also people I played with people when I played football. Sometimes when you do a mistake and then you do one again, you try to hide. You try well let let the other do the hard work. That is the advantage and a disadvantage of being in a team. And uh, but there are players that always wanted the ball. If they did four or five mistakes, they say, "Let me let me have the ball." It's a duty to give me the ball. So now I'm not sure that Erling will will do that. But Erling knows also. I've said that in different interviews that when people calling him a machine or calling him a monster, that is to underestimate the efforts, the work that he is doing to be to be a great footballer because he's only 22. He comes from a, a small, not small village, but a small city outside. Stavanger called Brune, and he's still that 22-year-old boy that is excited about playing football and made that long live in his career, that feeling of enjoyment playing football, and that you can see on him. And there's also another thing that you see a lot of these individuals in sport, very selfish, uh, having kind of all a matter of what they are doing. Uh, Erling is the one who is 
he is as happy when anyone else score. And I think that is also a part of his success because then the people around him will be generous because in a, in, I'm an individual who would love to be in a team sport, but that means that you have to work with your teammates, let them be generous, as is in a working place. You, you have to feel that the, the best team will make you good as well. And I, I always say that the, the most selfish one in the world should be in a team because it's no problem. Because if you, the selfish guy in the team, he knows that he to be good, that everybody look at him, that he will be, get the first prize. He's so depending on the team. So please give me a real, real cynical, selfish guy in a team because he will understand that he needs the team. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting one. <laughs> I mean, when, when Erling Holland and others uh, of that caliber and there's only a few play out there in the most important games, they seem to be so present, right? They seem to be playing as if they would be playing with, with, with their friends at school. And um, that practice of being fully present, that practice of managing the mind, which can go to the future, what will happen if I don't score to the past, what I maybe did wrong just a couple of minutes ago, that practice of being fully present, we can call it also the practice of mindfulness or, or meditation. Um, now, we have heard it, uh, Erling is, is very vocal about uh, doing meditation. <laughs> I remember him sitting as a player of Borussia Dortmund on the field in a meditation pose. And I also know that you uh, uh, practiced, I think, for the first time mindfulness a couple of months ago and uh, <laughs> wanted to check in with you how you think about it and how was how was your first experience on it? Well, first of all, you have to explain to the people that was at Ullevall Stadium with the Guru. He was there. Uh, I, I love him. Uh, I, uh, I love interviewing him. I mean, uh, he's brilliant when he takes up. But it, it took so long. And I was, I, I was felt, I felt a bit responsible for the crowd there. So, so when he said, close your eyes, and I would like try to open bit my eyes, has he slept in or something? <laughs> because I was, <laughs> I, I was so aware that, uh, that it should be. But, but I, I guess you are uh, kind of touching one of the biggest challenges we do have in, in the world because you, you will always find an excuse to be uh, on your phone. Uh, my family, we had a competition in the, in the holiday. We'd have a look to who was most on the telephone. They'll put it this way. I will never take an initiative to do that again because I was losing big time. But, but yeah. to, be, to be present in your life is also being present in your job. Uh, but mindfulness is also... Uh, kind of way i haven't done it a lot uh, as, as you know but i think there are different way to have that mindfulness i i have learned from sport to be very concentrated uh i was i'm i'm good i'm better live i i will be there that is a present to be that to take the room i need it now uh, that is a lot of coming into that is not only going into a lutus or whatever you want to do but it's also be very well prepared i i I will always be very well prepared. That that keeps you the confident. That keeps you presence. You can see watch people who is not good prepared. They will never have a presence. Uh, so that yeah. is very important. It's very important to be very interested in in other people, being curious about other people, thinking what they are thinking. Uh, there is um there is a there are different kind of intelligence, but I'm a big fan of something called cultural intelligence. A cultural intelligence is to understand other people, understand other nationality, other religions, to try to understand what they are saying. Uh, sometimes I find myself being a bigger fan of people who have the total opposite opinion than me, than those who agree with me, because I think it's very fascinating how other people uh, put their opinion to the, to the floor, how they do it. I don't agree with them. But I, I see that they have thought, I see they have thought it through, and I also like the way they present that to me. So the present is, sometimes the present is always defined as being there and to contribute something. I think that also you need to, to, to have the opposite thing, that you are there to learn, that you have people. I had, a, I had a time when I must admit that, and talking about the weaknesses, I remember there was a time in my middle of 20s, coming on to 30s, there were so many people uh, coming up to you, will talk football. And it was an excuse for me to say, I don't like small talk. I, uh, no, 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 I just walked on. 
But then I realized a bit later that that is a very, very bad habit to have because that means that you're not interested in people. So if you walk around in your life and you're not interested in people, that is a terrible, terrible thing to have. So to be present is always all presence to is all to also to be interested in new people, new views, different angles uh, to think and and learn from that because I think we are all some product of how we've grown or or education. And I'm coming from a, uh, from a very privileged country. There is so much I can learn from other people instead of sitting in Norway and tell other countries, other people what they should do with their life. You truly come from a privileged country, and you know Norway has been for me and for many this the, the country of peace. Um, it's it, it's so beautiful. People have a certain uh, inner calm, I, I would believe, and it is also a great great sport nation. Uh, I have just spent a couple of days with Inga Andersen, the former head of the Olympic Committee, and I learned. Uh, that uh, Norway is the most successful Olympic nation for the Winter Games with 405 medals since 1924. But then now, uh, Jan, uh, um, they have taken it, or you all have taken it to the next level. Um, uh, we, Swiss, uh, were always happy to have Roger Federer, but now you have uh, Gaspar Ruud, the world number two in tennis. You have Erling Holland. You are now dominating also the summer sports in, in a certain way. And so what would you say is the secret of success to, to, to that, really? Yeah, it's a good point that we know in summer we have a good golfer. We have two Olympic goals in, in running uh, with Ingebrigtsen and Varholm. So I think that you can take that to Switzerland. I, I think that every country needs an identity. Every, at least small countries, uh, sport is very important because that I always say when I, if I have a speech, I will say, tell people who is the, your, the Norwegian ambassador in the USA and they, nobody knows. And I would say, for me, it's Zuccarello, who is playing in the National Hockey League. Uh, who, is your, um, who is your ambassador in Germany? Well, it used to be Ola Einar Björndal, Axel Lundsvindal, and all these. So sports means a lot to, to Norwegians. And I think that that just shows you that it's a part of a national kind of thing. When we qualified for, for the World Cup in 1994, the whole country stopped because... We had no idea that Norway could we be good in football. I mean, the last 20 years, we've been every time last in the qualification group. And suddenly we were good in football. And everybody, it's kind of stopped. The Norway stopped uh, to, to watch that national team. And then there is a lot of good people. Inge Andersen is one of them who has been over years uh, worked systematic. I, it's also a small country that we can learn from each other. We can inspire each other. Uh, in the 90s, when, when the national team was good, there was a boom with the uh, Winter Olympics in, in Lillehammer. And people saw that if you can be good in cross country, maybe we can be good in slalom. Maybe we can be good in super G, downhill, football. Wow. Athletics. Wow. We can do that as well. So, so I think you can inspire each other. Um, having said that, when we're talking about success and failure, I will also say that although I'm a very, very proud Norwegian, Sometimes uh, it can also be a challenge for a nation like Norway. Yes, we are a peace-loving nation, but we should never come in a position that we should tell other people what to do. We could be someone who, who set up a platform. We can be someone who say, in our country, we would like to contribute to that. But I'm a big fan of people asking for it uh, instead of going tell them, because that gives me some... Uh, some reference to some history that we none in Europe should be proud of. So we have to find a balance between th these kind of things because sometimes when we see nations who are not developed as, as ours, we tend to forget that some years, maybe 100 years ago, Norway were the same or other countries were the same. So I think that that respect need to go into us as well when we talk about the peace-loving nation. Yeah, absolutely. Now, as you are speaking, I see these great uh, uh, T-shirts behind you. I see Bayern Munich. I, I see the German national team. I remember you scoring for Eintracht Frankfurt. Um, I think, you know, playing your potential means also loving the sports. Um, and I can feel that you love soccer. I remember I, I loved soccer so much. I had an accident with my back uh, you know, when I was 17. I had to let it go. Mm. I had to let it go. Um, and it took me actually, I was that time I was in our Swiss uh, junior national team. It took me um, almost two years to really let it yeah. go. 
um, yeah. to kind of uh, reinvent myself. It took a long time and I was, uh, you know, holding on to it too long in retrospective. Yeah. Do you still remember the day, the moment of your last game? And and, and how was that? Because I feel you're a, um, a role model for a very successful, as it seems, transition to the career after the career. How was it for you when you played your last game and how, how did you go about finding a new passion uh, or love uh, for something you do? It's a very good question because I think you touch on a very um, a, a theme that is very important. There is a, a very, very high of percentage of people after their career. I, I saw a survey once in England. There was three or four was either bankrupt or out of job five years after uh, careers. I, I, know, I don't know if that stat is updated, but I've seen the same numbers in, in, uh, in America. I think my my thing was that I was all I was when I played football I was also curious. So uh, when I signed for Rapid Vienna I was 22. I moved abroad. I I came to Vienna uh, which is one of my favorite cities and I learned that the synergy between culture, sport, politics, media, football that was great and I also was able to meet all these different people in 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 leading positions in those kind of areas but I just saw that they had a dream to play where I played at Rapid Vienna because they wanted to play football and that gave me self-confidence. And I, so I think that quite early doors, although I didn't know it, but I, I kind of thought that after my career, I wanted to live in this kind of area between the different angles. And when what you said in the introduction, I, would be, I'll be, I am working with politics, I'm working with commercial uh, people, I'm working with media and, and so on. So I said that early, early door, but I think your story put on a quite interesting thing because you identify yourself being exactly. someone mm -hmm. and and i think that is the biggest challenge for all sports people i've been sitting with world champions of norway in 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 one sport and he said to me i have no idea what i'm going to do and i said yeah f let's start with what can you do and i see i can't anything i can only do my sport and then you start a slowly process and I say yeah but you're quite disciplined yeah check uh, you are quite good as being good when you are supposed to be good. Yeah, that's true. You have, you know how to have a passion for something, yes. And by doing this, you kind of get people into a direction which is important in, in any job, whatever we do now or you do now, Christoph. I think that is, that is very, very important. There was a time when I stopped. I see that still when I, I can do, like, let's put it this way, of... What I do, one third will be TV media, which will be uh, in, in everybody knows what I'm doing. And the rest I do in my communication company uh, is under the radar. I just do my stuff and all that kind of things. And sometimes, uh, some years ago, I was a bit annoyed. Whatever I did, they said, this is the former football player. But I realized also that that was a good thing for, for me to kind of, I, I came from, about so when I talk politics, if I knew something about Constantinople in 1453, people would say, "Wow, uh, <laughs> is this is this a footballer who has a brain?" It was like it was like kind of that. So I think that I learned how to to take that in my advantage, and also that I I remember what wh why did wh why was I good in what I did is because I trained very very hard, and I think that it, whatever job you do, you have to train very very hard, and a lot of especially business people, they will say, we have no time to train. We are always playing games. Uh, and I say, well, then you can't improve, can you? Because if you're playing games all the time, you have to be able to train. And I think that was, there's a lot of sports people uh, after their football career, they think they can get any job or uh, wages in a new kind of role for free. And they forget that one of the reasons they were good at the, what they're doing was that they were training a lot. And so I think there's a lot of traps you can go into being a former uh, sportsman. But at, as the day, yes, I remember my, I think I remember my last game. I, I do remember my last game at Frankfurt. There was a club behind me. That was my last professional game. Then I went home to play a year in Norway. A miss, not 100% motivated. So I was not very, very successful. But I was one of those. I, I ended my career when I was 35. I had I had a career where I, I wasn't a lot of injury. So I knew that when I came to when I was 35, I had more or less taken out my potential. Yes, I could have done things differently, but I didn't have the people to at that time telling me this and that. But that's fair enough. And so 
I think that what we're coming back to, what we started at, when you have to fulfill your potential, I think that when you have fulfilled your potential, it's, it's easier to, to, to quit. Absolutely. And I very much resonate with your, with your aspect of identity, right? Um, apart from maybe loving what we do, sometimes we put so much of our identity of who we think yeah. we are and who we think other people should believe we are on one particular activity and that itself uh, is definitely the trap I was falling into uh, at that time. Um, very, very true. Thanks for reminding me of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, um, I don't know about the, your your schedule as a, uh, a TV anchor. Uh, the uh, World Cup is coming up in Qatar. And uh, we have been collaborating together also on the topic of ethics uh, in business, you have been moderating some of the conferences of the World Forum for Ethics in Business, and you have been working with the Ministry of uh, Norway on the on the topic. Um, when you now uh, see the, the the games coming coming closer, um, are you able to focus totally on on, on the joy of the game, or uh, is it a little bit shadowed by by all the discussion on on ethics and and how it came to Qatar really the World Cup? Well, it's absolutely a shadow, uh, with a shadow of a doubt, to use the, the word play, absolutely. But if you know your football history, this is not the first time that uh, a championship has been sent to, to places where maybe, uh, or not maybe, where the values are not as we want them to be. Um, one of the first World Cups I remember was going to Argentina in 78. There was a junta who wanted to, to wash things. I think that... Uh, the whole criticism uh, should go to FIFA uh, because FIFA at that time in 2010 said that it's going to be to Qatar and Russia at that time. More or less, I guess, nine of ten who was in that uh, committee are all been jailed or been taken out of corruption. That is one thing. Uh, and secondly, uh, I think that sports washing is... Uh, is a main main issue in international sport as you were saying i work i was a, a advisor to the vice president of vada the world anti-doping uh, agency and i saw how these organizations work uh, so i think that we should concentrate as criticizing mostly the international sports federations because it's not that i'm saying that the human rights, uh, how they treat people in Qatar and other Middle East countries or other countries around the world is good, uh, is bad. Of course they are. We can see that. But in a way to say it a bit like tabloid, to criticize Qatar for being Qatar, well, that, that is, that is then, they're never being more highlighted the things that is happening there. Then they, are they doing stupid things? Of course they are. Are they doing stupid things where, where they, uh, where they can't fill in the rules that the rest of us want to say that these are the, the common value of the world? Of course, that's terrible. But as a sportsman, and I put my sports hat now, I aim my criticism to FIFA because this is not the first time it's done. Hopefully it will be the last, but I'm, I'm not sure of that because uh, I'm sorry to say, and this is live, but international sport is corrupt. Uh, and I've seen that from the first row with uh, popcorn and Coca-Cola, which, which I've seen how this is done. And that makes me very, very worried. Will I see the World Cup? Of course I will. Uh, am I happy that people are highlighting the, 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 the broken uh, of the human rights in Qatar? Absolutely. I think that is a very, very part of it. But as a, I've always been an opponent of boycott. I always think it's better to be there. I always think it's better to use uh, that platform to do that. Will that get, go, get result? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, uh, unfortunately, I'm not sure about that. But uh, I will see. I will, of course, see the World Cup because I'm I'm into sport. But it's um, how FIFA has done this, and a lot of other sports organization has done this uh, over the years. It's terrible, and it's terrible because for sport for me is uh, the ten year old Jan Fjortov running around in a small village doing his sport, and we have this kind of ten year old boy or girl all around the world, and that we are discussing things like that is just sad, very very sad. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, <laughs> maybe we can have a moment of the 10-year-old Christoph speaking to the 10-year-old Jan <laughs> and asking you who will win. I know Norway is not there. Uh, who no. will win, Jan? Um, th that is, a, also, I saw just before I went down, I saw the squad of Brazil. I mean, that's an unbelievable set of players. 
They have so many great st- uh, strikers, six or seven of them, all world class. And uh, Firmino, the Liverpool striker, can't even get in the squad, the 26 man squad. Uh, France will be there. France will be there with, with a great team uh, in there, with a lot of great players going forward. And Hernandez, that I, I watched live on San Siro on Wednesday, a fantastic uh, player. And you always want to think that Argentina will do well with Messi, that he will get his World Cup. I don't think he will that. And I was growing up because Norway, will, we were never at the World Cup. So uh, I had to uh, uh, follow two other nations. And that was always Germany and England, funny <laughs> enough. And Germany and England, I follow them. So I have... As I work a lot in both countries now, I also uh, support them. But but then there will be uh, there will be outsiders. So uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to see who can challenge the the big ones. There is always one uh, surprise, you know. So that is uh, outsider we will look to see do well. Maybe it can be Switzerland this year. Yeah, we yeah. have a connection, Jan. I, I I had to also I wanted to cheer for somebody. Of course, uh, during my childhood, and it was not Switzerland because we never qualified. No. Typically, I watched the games in, in the German t shirt uh, uh, supporting the German squad. Yeah. John, thank you so much uh, for this discussion. Uh, playing your potential, I think uh, I can feel from your energy, from your liveliness, from the way you connect the dots, and from the depth of your reflection that you're really doing that. And for all of us wanting to learn from you, what would be that maybe if you have one advice? Uh, on what people can do to play uh, their potential, to be their true self. What would you? What What would that be? Be unbelievable curious. Okay. Whatever, just try to find out anything. If you that can be small things, small details, but I give you a training to find out other things. Uh, when you read a book, if there is a word you don't understand, if there is something you don't understand, Google it. Just put it on Google, and then you know straight away at least 99% uh, truth on Google. So just do it. Be curious because I think that is important because if you're curious, then you're also curious about people around you, people you meet, people, your Uber driver, they all got a story to tell. And there is always something to get out of uh, a story that you read or people you meet. So I think that will be my one single uh, advice. Great. That's that's fantastic, and I can I can I can literally feel that uh, <laughs> eagerness to learn from you. Really cool. Thank, thanks a lot, Jan, and uh, thanks a lot for all of you watching, um, staying with us. Uh, if you are curious, and I'm sure you are, of what's next with the Telex Institute, subscribe to the channel. Um, that would be really cool. Invite your friends, follow us on the social media, and uh, well, allow yourself to be yourself because you're great just the way you are. All the best. <laughs>